every semester, my students had to go find a black man over 40 and basically chronicle his life. And we put it up on the blog for people to see. They had to get a picture and they had to do this interview and they basically had to transcribe the interview and post it up. One, they find it hard to find black men over 40 that they can interview. That was one of the biggest problems. Two, the other problem I had, I, no, no, I didn't see coming. It was complaints from women online that this man, not that he was interviewed, but that he wasn't, that the interview wasn't structured in a way to denigrate him. Ex-wives, ex-girlfriends, you know, old friends, people we work with, you know, that nigga, he shouldn't be written about. He ain't this, he ain't that. And really the assignment is just an interview about his life. Where is he from? What did he experience? How does he feel? The fact that he was in being engaged just on humane terms and the interview wasn't structured and reliant on his denigration was offensive to a lot of the women that were writing in. Eventually, um, we kept doing that. And then uh, Heavy D passed away, the rapper. I grew up listening to Heavy D. I grew up with him. He was only a few years older than me. His masculinity was always a little different in hip hop. It wasn't overly, you know, machismo. He was always, he just seemed like the kind of brother you would want to hang out with, real cool and down to earth. I've heard that's the case. I've never met him. But when he passed away, it, it hit me because I had so much respect for him. So I wrote my first blog piece about him. Uh, and that began, that began an evolutionary process for me to really kind of work on this unspoken thing that I didn't know how to articulate about black men. And, and it's still going to this day, but it evolved into the YouTube channel and into the, my upcoming book with Rutledge coming out in August. I took my son to his first college orientation at this California school. 75% um, of the, the incoming students for next year were female. I took a picture of that. You know how they have a table, you pick up your tags. I took a picture of it and I put it on Facebook. The only tags left on the table after everybody was sitting in the auditorium were tags for males, tags for Spanish speakers, and then there was a whole list of tags for those who were non-binary. What that meant was the majority of people sitting in the room were primarily female, right? Those were the majority of the tags. There were no female tags left on the table. And when I walked in the auditorium, 75% of the students in there, if not 80, female. I saw three black males, including my son. And even when I looked for males across race, it was like needle in a haystack, right? Now, I'm not saying every school is like that, but eh, I did a show on Howard not too long ago. It is like that in a lot of places, Howard included. An accusation can be damaging, but we're also in the era of Johnny Depp. We're also in the era of Jonathan Majors. We're also in the era of, uh, what's Carly's last name? We're in the era where the argument, listen to all women, believe all women, is not, you know, it, there's finally a public kind of acknowledgement that that might be a little irrational. Listen to women, yes, but we still have to have evidence. We still have to have this notion of believing all women, at, and that's the end of the discussion. I mean, you got black men that have been in their graves for decades that are now being reframed as sexual aggressors, and they're not even here to defend themselves. But what happens when you have an 18 year old boy going into a space that's predominantly female? Any accusation can end his academic career and it doesn't even have to go off campus to the police. It doesn't even have to require evidence. My mentor taught me back in the early 90s, said every 17 year old girl that walks in, across this campus has your career in her hands. If you have a meeting with a student and close your door and she says, he said this, especially if you didn't, what leg do you have to stand on? So I'm just saying in this environment, and it doesn't work the other way. I can't call it, you know, and say, well, this 17 year old girl said X, Y, and Z to me in my office. Even the university will look at you like, okay, whether I'm lying or telling the truth, it, it's a one way dynamic. I can talk to you about brothers that have dealt with every race of women, but especially black women that have gone through something very similar. I got, an, I got a professor brother of mine who can no longer teach in his field because of a false accusation and a frustrated ex-girlfriend who called his job and told everybody at his job that he did X, that he didn't do. It required no evidence. They fired him on the spot. He can never teach in his field again after working through a doctorate, all because she was upset.
So we look at Jonathan Majors. She accuses him at the behest, in many ways, as they say, of a police officer who's, who's interviewing her and suggesting to her that he must have done these things to you. And she seems to go along with that. And then we find video evidence that there's no way possible that he could have committed those crimes, that she shows up in the club a couple hours later doing fine, feeling fine. Right. But it took those video clips for people to step back and say, OK, well, maybe he's innocent. In the meantime, he's lost so much momentum on his career. Nobody cares. I don't know how many of the, the deals he had set up have called him back, apologized. Hell, they they didn't do it to Johnny Depp for the longest. I don't know if they're going to do it for majors. But to the extent that majors is emblematic of black men or men in general, you know, the question is what kinds of protections are there, especially in environments that are already hostile to young black men? The problem is a lot of people don't tend to believe that black males and, and females have a different quality of life. They have a different set of options made available to them. They have a different road in society. The idea is if we're all black, we grew up in the same house, what I experience is what you experience. The only time I see this really break, and I think I said this to you before, is when I see mothers of sons. Mothers of sons will be the first ones to say, oh, shit, this is something. Or you'll find mothers who have a daughter and a son. And she'll be like, OK, these are very different experiences. But she's grown up in a family with brothers and sisters. It never dawned on her until she had a, a son. You know what I mean? And that's kind of where you see this slow acknowledgement that the fact that we're all black is not an, is, is not clarifying enough. We've talked about how gender adversely affects women and girls. We assume that that's the only group gender adversely affects. We have no vocabulary for how gender adversely affects men and boys. So when boys interject it, they're, they're dismissed because their gender experience doesn't reflect women's gender experience. So it must not be happening. It's not until usually you see a mother of a son who's watched this boy grow up from birth and start to go through things that she hasn't had to, that other girls, your, her son's age hasn't had to. Then she starts to say, something's going on here. I showed a film, I think it's still on YouTube. I showed that in class. My young men went nuts. They went nuts because this was the first thing they saw outside of like Antoine Fisher. And most of them were too young for Antoine Fisher, unless I was showing it in class. But outside of that, it was the first film they saw that spoke to them. Again, this is precursor to Kevin Samuels, you know, so on and so forth. So they they went nuts. And I remember there was a particular exchange that took place in one class. One of my young women, brilliant, very intelligent. And, the, and one of my young men who was considered, nobody ever said this out loud, but he was considered not to be anywhere near as bright, right? This was the attitude I think people had. So the film ends and she immediately raises her hand. She says, I've never seen anything like this in real life. I don't know any woman like this. I, this is bullshit. And she just went off, right? And then you just see behind her, this hand just go. And I was like, yes. And he was like, this is my sister. And then another man sitting next to him was like, yo, this is my cousin. Another one was like, that's my auntie. And, and, and you saw a number of these men and they weren't yelling. They weren't screaming. They were just like, nah, that's my mother. You know what I mean? And they started to tell stories about divorce and court, family court and not being able to see their fathers and sisters getting into fights with them and girlfriends calling the police on them just because they could. And, and, and you saw this in this moment, the young women that were in the class were looking around like, what the hell is going on? And it was almost like, this is the other side of the scale that I couldn't get three or four years ago. I'm well familiar with the feminist complaints. I've been hearing them for four decades. What I'd never heard was this. So as the men started to talk, then we started to actually have conversations about, OK, what is it you're actually going through at home, at school and in, in, in intimate relationships? And the more they started to talk, what we noticed is the feminist vocabulary we had was not flexible enough. It didn't have enough nuance to engage men. And so then it became clear that we needed a new vocabulary. So around this time this is when I meet Tommy Curry and he and I are very much in alignment about this need. And we're coming at it from different experiences, but you know, we're very much in alignment in terms of this need.